Oops. Okay, good morning. Would those at the door please close the door? And then maybe come to the front, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to the core working group. I'm Carsten Bormann. This is Jaime Jimenez. Um, this is an ITF meeting. Uh, we are at Wednesday in the ITF, so I think by this time you, you know the uh, routine. Um, have you prepared a uh, notes document? We're using the Etherpad, right? Um, yeah, I mean, the Etherpad is prepared, but we should ask for some. I okay. have one, one note taker for now. Okay, so who else wants to be note taker, at least for the part where they are not giving a presentation, maybe? There is an Etherpad for doing that, so you don't have to do all the typing. Can you do that, Christian, or are you busy preparing? Thank you. And please note the note well. Um, as you may have noticed, we actually have a new RFC with updated IPR uh, rules. So this is uh, as good as an uh, occasion as uh, anyone to actually go and read that again. You may actually learn something new there. And there's a little bit more detail on uh, this uh, slide. And I'm putting the, the, the link to the HTML version of that uh, up here as well. Uh, but of course, the, the, the actual relevant rules are in, in the RFCs uh, pointed to uh, here. And, and the very, very short version is um, if you are uh, contributing something, talking here in the working group, and are talking about the technology, the technology where you know there are patent claims uh, on it, uh, you have to tell us, or you can choose not to talk about the technology. Okay, agenda. Um, we um, have pulled up some of the, why does it say Tuesday? <laughs> Sorry, today is Wednesday. Um, we It's going to say Tuesday about 10 more times on, on the slide. Oh, it's time warp, yes. So, I mean, ju just go around the Earth once and then it's still Tuesday. Um, so, uh, we have pulled up some of the material from Friday where we only have a 90 minute uh, slot. Uh, so, we will do a quick status update, look at uh, two documents that are in the ISG right now, then look at documents that are uh, getting ready for working group last call. And then there are a few things that have been pulled forward from uh, Friday. We have a little bit of a difficult scheduling this time because um, there is a TLS meeting in parallel. Uh, so we had to push some of the things to Friday and that's why this is, Friday is pretty uh, full. Um, Alexey, you want to say something? Um, yeah, I just noticed that the, the URI TCP protocol discussion has quite a lot of time. Um, Adam asked me, you know, is core working group going to discuss it? If yes, I would rather be present, but he needs to be in TLS. I'm not sure, you know, how to accommodate his request, but it... I don't think we can push this on right. Friday because um, it's already so full. Well, I, I think we have some kind of way forward from the discussions on Sunday. Yes. So if we try to stay more factual about it and just, I yeah, I, I, I think what the, 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 the what is on the agenda here is the working group needs to digest what what came out and find out whether actually everything still works. Sure, that's the agenda item for today. I think that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on the agenda? Okay. Um, so, working group status, uh, one RFC 
uh, got published uh, between the last meeting and now, RFC 8132. Uh, so we now have a few more methods in CoAP, the patch methods, patch and iPatch, and a method that is called fetch. Uh, that, that name rhymes nicely with uh, uh, patch, uh, but maybe confusing to, to people who uh, know about HTTP fetch. Um, it's uh, something that is called HTTP, uh, called search in HTTP. It's a get with a body for uh, parameters. So th that is available now, and that is uh, actively being used uh, by a number of things that are uh, going on. A couple of advertisements. Uh, there is a DNSSD meeting this afternoon, and uh, while we are only talking about the resource directory on Friday, uh, obviously we have a strong relationship with DNSSD, uh, so those who are interested in the resource directory probably want to be there. Tomorrow there will be a site meeting uh, between uh, the people who want to run Yang on the IoT and those who <coughs> do Yang in other areas. Uh, it's quite interesting, the, the NetMod meeting was in parallel to the CBOR meeting on Monday. Nobody thought that maybe the, that there might be a conflict, maybe there wasn't, uh, but uh, we want to coordinate better and that's why we have a, a side meeting to do that. Tim. Uh, hi. Yeah, thanks for the advert for DNSSD. I'm one of the co-chairs. So we have an internet draft that Kerry Lynn, Peter van der Stock, and a couple of other people have written. So if, even if you can't make the meeting, I urge you to look at that. It's about mapping between DNSSD and Core RD. So have a look at that. And it's on the agenda towards the end of the meeting. So even if you just pop in for the last 20 minutes, you'll have to be able to take part in that discussion. Thank you. Okay, looking at our own milestones, uh, we, we are a bit late. Um, we actually managed to, to do this milestone here, uh, the color of which I cannot change in uh, Keynote for some reason. I have to find out why. Um, anyway, th this is interesting because things came up during uh, the IETF last call that we want to talk to in a couple of minutes. Um, yeah, but uh, uh, CNML, resource directory and the Komai uh, work are in this meeting and uh, I hope we make significant progress uh, here. SenML uh, will complete its working last call today, by the end of today, I think. Um, so we, we might be able to clean this up a little bit more. Another interesting development, the core interfaces uh, document has had some personal changes and now has had another round of personal changes. And uh, now I'm quite confident that we will be able to make progress, but we probably only will be able to discuss them um, in uh, Singapore. So expect something happening with the uh, DIN link and the interfaces uh, draft uh, soon. So one of the, the reasons why th this is complicated work, even though the drafts themselves are not so complicated, is that early versions of these documents have been picked up by other SDOs and uh, put into their specifications. And we just have learned a lot uh, from that. So it, it's probably useful to look at that again and uh, uh, see uh, what, what the result is on uh, those documents. Tim? Hi, uh, Tim Karinoke. I just have a quick question on, on some of these milestones that you have here. And I'm just trying to get an understanding of uh, potential uh, publish dates, just to try to figure out what's what we think is going to be published this year, and maybe what we pushed off in next year. Because I get these questions, <laughs> you know, as well. So, um, you know, for, for with respect to the resource directory and the CNML, do we actually think that we're going to get a something published this year? Yes. Okay, that that's what I'm trying to get at because I couldn't get it through the, the some of the dates that you've got up here, right? Alexey Melnikov, maybe chairs and AD should discuss updating milestones to just be more realistic. Yes. Okay, just, just to give you about my personal assessment here, SenML, I think we can uh, process the working group last call comments on Friday. 
and then we will take a couple of weeks until the authors have something that can be pushed to, uh, to the ISG. So this is uh, very close. Uh, resource directory, we, we had a pretty productive meeting uh, this morning, and uh, the, the authors think we now have, uh, we now understand why it took us so long to get where we are, and uh, how we can make this, uh, uh, how, how we can finish this uh, quickly. Uh, so this will uh, become evident on Friday, and this should uh, go to working group last call, maybe after one or two uh, reiterations. And uh, Komi, of course, is a set um, of documents, and we will talk about their status uh, later, but uh, at least uh, one of the four documents is really ready for working group last call now, and uh, the other ones, well, they do require some more coordination within the uh, IETF, which is uh, happening tomorrow. Uh, so I'm, I'm also confident that we actually can get all these documents uh, through Working Group Last Call this year. They may not be published this year because there are steps after Working Group Last Call, but uh, we, we should be able to <clears throat> process them. I'm sorry, Carson. I'm just, again, I'm just trying to figure out um, in, in are you are we saying that the the documents on this list or or just the um uh the comey set uh w would probably not be published this year i'm, I'm still kind of curious about uh resource directory and send because we kind of use those back in lightweight mdm so yes i, I just so didn't know again i think sentiment is the the most advanced at this point in time um so th th there are a few things that still can be discussed Maybe the best way to handle those things is to just not include them and put them in as extensions. And uh, apart from that, um, yeah, it, wait until this evening until we know all the working group last call comments, and uh, then we should be able to process them on Friday. So it's really imminent. Uh, and the other ones are progressively a little bit more work. Resource directory, we have a clear direction, but have to write it up. And after writing up, we will get comments. Right. And so, but I guess my question is, is that for those particular drafts, are there, um, do we see any hurdles of actually be publishing them this year? That's what I'm trying to drive at. At least we know. Okay. I, I think that, they, that, they, that's what I, I, yeah. I just got mixed up when you were talking about the Comey yeah. stuff. Well, Comey is a set of drafts and some of them we actually might be publishing this year yeah. and some of uh, them might get into early next year. Okay, so this is about uh, working group status. Um, now let's talk about the, the two documents that from the point of view of the working group are already uh, published, uh, but uh, that, that have uh, got an interesting discussion. Uh, one is uh, links JSON, just to remind everyone, we have this RFC 6690. Uh, which is usually referred to as link format, uh, which does two things. It defines a serialization for uh, web links, which are defined in 5988. And it also profiles 5988, where profile is, uh, well, a bad word. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, 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 we took 5988 and, and took what we liked and maybe ignored what we didn't like a little bit more than we should uh, have. Anyway, so this document uh, has been out there a long time, has been the, the basis for a lot of work in other SDOs. And um, now uh, it turned out that it's useful to have JSON and SIBO serializations apart from the text-based serialization that 6690 uh, provides. So this is what links JSON is about. And now the, the comment uh, that we should have thought about, but didn't, uh, was, uh, well, this is a 6690 serialization. Can we use this as a gen general 5988 serialization? And the answer is, hmm. So we, we did some things in 6690 that, that are a little bit icky for that. Uh, one is we, we essentially disallowed percent encoding. So uh, we would have to define for this serialization what uh, semantics percent encoding would have. And uh, the other thing 
uh, we did, we defined a few default values uh, for certain elements uh, of a link. And <clears throat> we might want to look uh, whether we can, um, yeah, make, make this work in the general case so people who don't want those default values can do something different. So th that would be a change. It would not be a big change, but it would be a change that we would want to coordinate with those SDOs who have picked up the links JSON uh, work uh, already. So this is one area of work. Um, now, the, the problem uh, here, or maybe the fortunate uh, thing, I don't know, um, is that 5988, this is happening. So 5988, uh, which had a couple of places that were really not very well defined, um, is being revised and uh, <clears throat> a number of bugs or potential implementation snags are being fixed and a number of clarifications are made. So what is called link attributes is now called target attributes. So it becomes much clearer that all those attributes you, you put on a, a web link are really not about the link itself. They are not labeling uh, the, the uh, vertex, they, they are uh, labeling the target. Uh, so this is much less confusing. Um, th there is another thing that's uh, happening there. Um, the the uh, new version explicitly disowns the namespace for the target attributes and says the owners of serializations should coordinate uh, the namespace. And I think that's a really useful clarification because we were kind of pushing forward and backward the, the responsibility for managing that namespace. And it's now clearly defined the management is in our uh, court. Um, so uh, yeah, this is still a, a, a individual draft. So the consensus process has not completed, but if that actually happens, uh, we probably should do that. Alex. Um. I just put the document on next IG telechat in two weeks. So great. So we, if we, you have comments, you better I, I have and, give them I to have me soon. Them, but uh, yes. Um, so I think my comments are already uh, uh, addressed in, in the current version. Of that. So that's wonderful. So uh, this is uh, this means we really get a stable way to uh, stable basis to uh, operate uh, on here. But this, of course, uh, also means uh, this is the time where we have to rethink a few of the 6690 um, assumptions. Really, we should be respinning 6690. I'm not sure that's actually necessary. Um, but we may want to do a few things, maybe in the links JSON document that, that react uh, to this. So um, yeah, coordinate with 5988 bis. Uh, which means we, we will watch that, that next telechat very closely. And uh, on the other hand, coordinate with all the usages of, of links JSON and the resource directory, which is kind of a, a, a variant of links, uh, of link format or links JSON on steroids. Um, coordinate with those users and variants and coordinate with other SDOs. So lightweight M2M is using a form of the resource directory um, OCF is using a form of links JSON, and there's just a lot of people we have to talk to to, to find out uh, whether we are doing something stupid. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we might define this target attribute registry. Uh, we will probably discuss offline whether we do this in links JSON or in a separate document. Um, so if we do it in links JSON, it becomes an updates uh, relationship to 66. Uh, 90 and when we have made all these changes uh, we probably have to decide whether we pull this back and do another working group last call and submit it to the isg again uh, or handle this within the the isg process but but before i uh, form an opinion on on that i would like to understand how many changes do we actually uh, get there so th this is uh, my plan for for working with this uh, a document and uh, again this is formally in the ISG now but of course the working group should pay close attention because there are so many things that depend uh, on this. Any comments on this?
I see one person nodding. Okay. Good. So if you do have comments, please send them to the list uh, so we can uh, make sure that, that we, we do the right thing. Okay, next item. Uh, COEP over TCP, TLS, and WebSockets. I'm, I'm always abbreviating this as COEP TCP. There are other people who are abbreviating this as COEP TLS. Uh, maybe a little bit uh, uh, confusing. Um, now, this uh, document um, has received ISG processing. And uh, one big comment was the, the way we are handling UI schemes is uh, not good. Um, so we, we pushed this to the ISG as uh, dash 07, as version dash 07. And uh, we, we had had extensive discussions about, about how to handle uh, multiple transports uh, with URIs and came up with a solution to have one URI scheme per transport. That's not something that anybody in this working group particularly likes, but it came up as the, the least worst uh, solution that we could uh, come up with. Now, um, of course, we are not the only people with that problem. So while we are going through the URI review process, OPC UA came in with a very, very similar request. They also have uh, three different ways of referencing OPC UA uh, resources, and they were trying to register through, uh, three URI schemes uh, as well. So it has become kind of obvious that uh, maybe there is a bigger uh, problem there. And when we have a bigger problem, uh, we call in the Internet Architecture Board, and I'm giving the microphone to uh, Dave Taylor. Who has now managed to escape from being Internet Architecture Board. <clears throat> okay, so I actually wrote a draft in between last IETF and this IETF, uh, and there's the name of it if you're looking for it. Uh, so I gave the presentation in art area on Monday, and I'm going to be giving a slightly different version of that topic and gloss over a couple things that are outside of core and go deeper into things that are, are specific to core. Uh, so as Karsten mentioned, just between last IETF and this IETF, there's sort of been three different discussions going on, well, two and a half discussions going on. There's the OPC one, which is the third bullet that Karsten was just talking about. There's ours, which is the first bullet. And then um, OCF had a uh, liaison message that came and said, uh, hey, we like the schemes in 07. And if the IETF is deciding to not register those, then the OCF will just register them provisionally. And since draft 09 then appeared and OCF didn't get an answer, those schemes are now actually registered, the, the ones in the top bullet are actually registered right now in the ANA registry as provisional and they're registered to OCF. Now the message from OCF said, and if you want them back, you can have them back. Okay. And by the way, the, the process for your URI scheme uh, registration, um, which is RFC 7595, whose editor is me, actually defines a process. If the IETF wants schemes back, you can do that even without asking the organization. So in other words, th there's ways to do it, but OCF would say, yes, if IETF wants them, please. The only reason OCF registered them was because IETF seemed to be saying that they were not going to. Okay. So anyway, um, because of these three things, there's all kinds of emails on various mailing lists, such as URI review, which is the mailing list that was uh, tasked with reviewing um, request for permanent registrations, which originally both uh, CORE and OPC were asking for permanent registration, right? OCF was asking for provisional if and only if IETF didn't do it themselves. Because provisional, you can do anything you want. However, the IETF, for standards, must do permanent, right? We don't have the option of doing provisional. Any other SDO does, but we don't. All of our standards must be permanent, which is we have to follow our own rules. Okay, so I wrote this document to collect the different ways that people were doing things because this is not a document that was focused just on core because, as Carson mentioned, this is a common problem. Um, and so there's different people do things different ways. And so it surveys a couple ways people are either already doing things or are proposing to do them on, do them on the list. And it points out the advantages and problems with each of those approaches. Okay. And some of those came from the core discussion. Some of them came from the other uh, discussions and references to even older discussions, right? All right, 
And so there's a couple documents, such as, you know, the W3C has a document. And so one of the basic principles that the IESG mentioned and the W3C mentioned was this notion that a resource, as named by, say, an application, should really have one canonical URI that's independent of how you get to it, right? So if the IP address changes, you don't have to change the URI, right? If the, and in this case, if the transport protocol changes, you know, if you're using UDP versus TCP, if it really is the same resource, if you can name it the same thing, right? That's the advantage, or that, that there is an advantage of that. And so there's documents that talk about that. So an example of why that argument is there is, uh, in the web architecture, things like links are used to say which resources are more valuable than others, right? This is one of the arguments that's made in the, in the uh, architecture, the WWW. Um, it says, and so in order to value something, you have to count how many in links there are, how many places there are that point to it, right? And if they don't point to the same thing, it messes up your valuation, right? So that's an example of the style of things. Um, similarly, you can make the same argument in, in the other, in like 3986, which has different ladder levels, right? Which is, how do I compare whether two URIs are equivalent, right? As well, there's multiple different ways. Do you just compare the string, right? Do you take care of um, uh, other types of things like dot dot resolution? Do you go all the way down to saying, um, is there information about uh, that's specific to the scheme because every scheme can have different rules? Or do you actually resolve it and see if they point to the same content, right? So the point is that there's different algorithms specified in 3986, um, and that's what we mean by ladder levels, okay? And so it is absolutely legal to have multiple URIs that point to the same resource, okay? But there's a reason to minimize that, and so we'll talk about that, okay? Now, 39, 75.95, sorry, in order to get a permanent scheme, it had a list of requirements, okay? The list of requirements in that RFC does not include this topic. And so the interesting thing that happened was to say, well, is this something that is a blocker for this document or not? And that's what actually generated some of the process discussions, let alone the technical discussions that slowed this down. Okay, all right. So now I'm gonna talk about one thing that is specific to CORE and its relationship to OCF. And I think we even have a joint meeting in Singapore, right? Um, yeah, which is the, the Saturday preceding the Singapore meeting is a joint meeting with OCF, right? Uh, because OCF is one of the top users of, of the core uh, documents. And so I'm going to talk just a little bit because there was three different um, use cases and it's helpful to understand what OCF's use case was because it illustrates some of the points that people are making on the list more generally. And so in the OCF case, there is a higher layer API that's an independent transport and there's an example on the screen, it's OCF colon. It's not one of the ones that comes out of the core working group, okay? And so the people that say, well, you should just be using one common URI that's independent of transport, well, OCF does that, right? It's, you know, hash a public key slash whatever the rest of the URI is, okay? But you still need a way to get the actual transport endpoints, right? What's the actual, you know, host name or IP address or what's the actual port number? What's the actual transport protocol? Is it TCP or is it UDP or is it WebSockets? Is it TLS or not? Okay. So you still have a way to resolve those or to learn those. Now, some transports that we work over, like WebSockets, already uses, you know, URIs as the way to name endpoints, right? It's not a port number. You have to have something in DMUX. And this was shown in Draft09, right? Um, and so for consistency, OCF found it convenient to just use URI format for all the transports. And so the schemes that was in Draft07 was great for that. I added a slide on uh, that's the next one that will show an example. Now, how you learn that might be via some lookup step, which is take this URI, do some step to resolve it to some transport identifiers. Or it might be, however you got that URI in the first place, you also got the other information that came along with it, right? Similar to when you're resolving a DNS name or when you're resolving a name through the DNS, you might get back some additional stuff in the additional record section thinking, saying you might need this too, right? So there's different ways to get it. Now, when, in theory, this could happen at multiple layers, right? If you have some application layer protocol that sits on top of something else and that sits on top of, top of something else and in each of those is a fork and there's multiple possible things at the next layer down, it can be really complicated. We just hope that that is really rare, okay? Draft09 started introducing that case, as you'll see, but Draft07 did not have that case. So here's an actual example for those of you in front or that can bring it up on your own screen in the back. Uh, this is an OCF example where the red 
is the top level API. You can see here it's split into a base URI and a relative uh, reference that goes along with it. This is their link format because they forked a, a link format a long time ago for reasons we won't go into right now because it was sort of before the time of Michael and me. Um, and so the red layer is what the application is supposed to use, right? And so that's the one that doesn't know anything about the transport, okay? But when you get back those links, you're getting back the blue along with each one. And so the blue contains a list of transport layer links, okay? So for example, in the first one, it's accessible only over CoEPS. And the second example, actually all three of the other ones, is accessible over CoEPS and CoEPS plus TCP. The point is those aren't really supposed to be used by the applications, they're just used by the protocol stack to say, here's how I get the transport identifiers, okay? And so this is why LCF said, yes, we really like this because it compresses stuff into one layer, because you can see they can only go one layer down. This is a single array, right? This isn't a tree of stuff, right? And so if this was saying, this was co-app S and you gotta go another layer down to get the WSS colon that was in draft 09, LCF said, well, that doesn't work for us because right, we can only do one level of stuff. But if you have these, it works great. And they already submitted their draft as to ISO as international standards. So they're past the point that they can make a change right now, which is why they went ahead and registered them as provisional. Now, could they do something different in the future? Possible, but for this version of the standard, that's already locked. Okay. So this is just an example that shows an upper layer URI and lower layer APIs, you can think of this being like an ID locator split where the locators are being transmitted in the syntax of a URI, okay? All right, so now to finish up the, the sort of the conceptual things, there was a number of discussions that sort of convoluted, and so I try to tease apart the notion of discovery versus selection, okay? So discovery is I have to get back the set of possibilities, okay? And selection is, once I know the set of possibilities, how do I choose one, right? Do I use a happy eyeball style algorithm? Do I use something else, okay? So most of this is not about the selection algorithm, although that's what a lot of people want to talk about. That's not the purpose of this, of this topic. The purpose of this topic is how do you get the list to be able to choose from, whether it's a selection or a happy eyeball style or whatever, okay? So if you want to talk about selection, that's at least out of scope for the main question even though there's a whole section of the document that I added because everybody wanted to talk about it, so I captured that too, okay? So there's four possible discovery approaches that I've seen, okay? The first one, and of probably the uh, last two means the one on the next slide are the ones that are the most relevant to us, and so these I'm gonna gloss over fairly quickly unless people have questions. The first one is the document that specifies the URI scheme specifies it and you hard code it, right? TFTP is an example of that. You can read the bullets. Second example is you take all the information that you need and you encode it into a single URI, right? So if you support two transports with different port numbers somehow, or a service name that's accessible over two things, you encode that all in the same common URI. Yeah, that's really ugly. Okay, next one. All right, number three is a set of URIs, one per transport stack, right? That's what Draft07 did, okay? That's what this working group had consensus on at the time that it was submitted to the IESG, right? This, of course, results in there being multiple equivalent URIs, right? Multiple URIs that point to the same resource that differ by, say, URI scheme, and maybe by things in the authority component, such as, you know, a port number, if there's a port number present, okay? Now, because of that, this often results in the need to have a higher layer API, i sorry, higher layer URI, such as the OCF colon in the OCF case, right? OPC, on the other hand, does not have one of these, right? And so I think a number of the discussion along the IESG and on the list in response to Draft 07 was, well, you're missing this thing, right? Okay. And OCF said, we're not missing it. We like Draft 07, please, right? Okay, so that's kind of how that went. Now, this works great unless, of course, you have complex stacks with multiple layers. So for most purposes, this is okay if you have a higher layer one and a set of lower layer ones, but if you could ever have a tree of stuff, it gets more complicated, and we hope that doesn't happen very often. And the only natural place to vary, to have multiple transport URIs, so one per transport stack, is to vary by the URI scheme. Yes, there's other places you can wedge that, and the draft covers that too. You can wedge it into various places, like in the authority, or using the port number as a hint. And there's a nice document that was in this working group um, that um, covered a number of those possibilities, and this is the more sort of non-core specific draft, okay. The last category was also discussed, again, on the URI review list, which is, why do you even want to use a URI format for that, right? So if you go back to, to the example here, 
Right. I get why the, to re paraphrase, I get why the red is a URI. Why is the blue in URI syntax and not some other syntax? Right? Th those would be sort of from the W3C that says, well, those things are sort of following the architecture of the World Wide Web. You should be something other than URIs for that. You're kind of messing with our URI stuff, right? And so that's, that's category four, which is using a format other than URIs. Now, the disadvantage is that if some of those transports, URI is the natural thing to use, such as a web socket. Another thing, say, raw TCP sockets, there's no URI scheme for a raw TCP socket, right? And so it, the, the well, no, there isn't. You're looking at me weird. Uh, there's, there's no, you know, TCP colon uh, today registered. Okay. There could be, right, but there isn't. And so uh, the disadvantage is if you pick something other than, a, other than URIs, you have to define some format or agree that you're not going to have consistent ones across transports, right? So if you have some application layer protocol that could be using web sockets and TCP and uh, DTLS over UDP, say co-op maybe, um, then you'd have to define some other common syntax or define a way to carry things in multiple syntaxes. And so URIs happen to be convenient for that. Okay? And so the advantage of, of three over four is just you can use a common syntax that exists. Okay? But that's, the, that's the, dis the debate between three and four, just to put it out there. Right? That's a, sort of a well-known debate now. So those are the four categories. Um, and uh, the last slide was specific to art, which is uh, that particular draft. And so at this point, okay, that's the overview. And so I'm, I guess I'm going to hand it back to Karsten to, you want to cover this or do you want me to moderate this? Which is, what do we do in the co-app TCP document? Right. You want me to hand it back to you? Yes. Okay. But of course, it would be good if you would exert your moderating. Uh, <laughs> Yes, please. <laughs> um, Stuart Chash, uh, Apple. Excuse me. Uh, one thing quickly. Um, Etherpad seems to be down right now, and we want to have good uh, nodes uh, of the discussion. So could the note takers <coughs> just type locally for, for a couple of minutes until we <coughs> uh, get something like a Google Docs or something set up to Yeah, I have a few more slides. Stuart, no, please. Stuart Jesh from Apple. Uh, it might be helpful to jump back to slide 19, if you can do that. <coughs> um, I will confess to some frustration about this whole process. Um, I've basically ended up devoting most of my adult career to working on service discovery. I didn't plan that. I thought I would graduate and go to Apple, do that a couple of years and move on, and it turned out to be a bigger problem. Um, one of the points you raised, Dave, is about the port number, which has always been this historical anomaly, I would argue a mistake in the IP architecture. Uh, uh, in, in Apple Talk, uh, at names name these two pools, which are net, subnet, host, port, and they take you all the way to the target process. In, in the internet, uh, a typical DNS name is a host name, which gets you to a piece of hardware, and then we go, oops, we forgot to specify what endpoint on this hardware, and then you tack colon port on the end of the name. Uh, so the, the, the pain you describe about how do you cram the port number into this, you don't describe the same pain with how do you cram the IP address in, because that's looked up by the name resolution mechanism. And I, I know you know this well, Dave, with DNS service discovery, that's why we used SRV records, because SRV records remedy this omission that the internet historically left the port number out of the resolution. I wrote RFC 6760, which is sort of the requirements document, and there's a section in there entitled, I think, Escape the Tyranny of Well-Known Ports. And it's very frustrating to me that I wrote this up 15 years ago, and yet we're still having years of soul searching and navel gazing, worrying about how to solve this problem. I'll let you answer that first, and then sure, I have a sure, second, sure. second um, comment so on this. I, I think I had two or three points. Let me see if I can keep them in my head. Um, the first one is that the discussion around service names is actually one of the topics in the draft. And one of the things that I complain about is the fact that you can't put a service name in the URI. You can only put an integer where the port number field goes. Okay, That is one of the problems that causes some headaches, right? Um, the, and the 
hurdles that people try to jump through to in, in, in making proposals to, to to stick in a service name someplace are uh, convoluted to say the best. Uh, the which is incidentally addressed by your comment that why does this have to be a URI at all? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, second point, in the examples that are used in the link format, whether you're talking about the link format used by OCF, the link format used by the IETF, okay, um, you can see here there in this particular example, right, if we looked at a core links example, you'd see something similar where the links here are including IP addresses, not DNS names. And you can say, well, you know, why is that? Okay. Well, it's because they don't want to have to go through an extra step of DNS resolution or even MDNS resolution for that matter, because this will work even if it's not on link and there's no ability to register in a DNS server. However, then you can say, well, why didn't you just use DNS SD for this whole thing? Okay. You could and, say that. <laughs> and the answer to that, minor say, because this is for constrained devices, and constrained devices already have to support a particular protocol to access the resource. And so if they have a fixed amount of code space available, then implementing two protocols, one for discovery and one for accessing the resource, is more expensive than having one protocol that does both. And that's why they did this. Yes, I'm familiar with that argument, yeah. and I think you know I'm unconvinced. One, one, one additional comment here. Um, now, there, there's another subtle difference here. Uh, this is about resource discovery and not service discovery. And uh, there's another fine point, I think, that, that we need to uh, pick up. So we have hosts, we have services, we have resources. And now, could you, in theory, use service discovery for doing resource discovery, which is another level down? Could you, in theory? Yes. Do people now? No. Could they? Yes. Other than the constrained uh, uh, argument. Right. I, I would be happy to engage in discussion about that because I know we've talked about this before and uh, people in the CURP, CURP community make this great distinction that, that a resource is different to a service. Now, and when this, I look right at Right now it, the main argument is not that one. The main argument that I have heard from people, right, because I'm an ITF person <coughs> in other communities, right, the main argument that I've heard from others is <coughs> uh, we don't want to have to have a DNS, which includes MDNS, implementation <coughs> in these tiny devices. Let me very briefly tell a little anecdote. In the early days, we, we, we had these developer workshops at Apple where developers would come in, a bit like Hackathon, right? They'd bring a laptop and a board and, and we'd work on code. Uh, one of the ones I remember, little device, you can still buy it, it's called SitePlayer Telnet. It's, it's a little box the size of a deck of cards. Um, it goes from Ethernet to serial ports. So if you've got some old device on your network with a serial console, you can plug this dongle in and now you can Telnet to it over Ethernet. This thing has 16 kilobytes, not megabytes, 16 kilobytes of flash memory. 9K of that is the HTML text for its web-based UI. And in the remaining seven kilobytes, he's got everything else. Ethernet driver, ARP, IP, DHCP client, um, Telnet server, web server to serve the UI, whole deal in 7K. He came to this workshop and said, I have 900 bytes free to implement multicast DNS. And by the end of that afternoon, he had this thing advertising both its telnet service and its web UI using multicast DNS in 900 bytes. And that product is still on the market today. And it still has 16K of flash memory in it. And it still does all of these things. I've got a couple of them in my house to connect to old legacy gear with serial ports. So I think in today's world, um, if you don't have 900 bytes of code space left, then yes, I buy the argument. But anything that's got more than 900 bytes of free code space, you can do multicast DNS. Anyway, that was the anecdote. The comment on this slide, which I think you alluded to, Dave, but I wanted to elaborate on it, because I have come to realize this is a more subtle issue. Um, people who used Apple Talk sort of read the docs and got this ingrained in them, but most people in this room are actually bet nobody in this room has done Apple Talk programming apart from me. Um, so in, oh, I'm. <laughs> Those remote, that was Kerry. <laughs> okay, nobody apart from Kerry and I. Um, uh, so to address that, uh, th there's a brand new 00, zero draft I submitted for the DNS SD, which is the roadmap document. And, and I would love to get feedback on that. It's a pretty short document, but, but I tried to outline some of the principles. And one of them is uh, 
many, many self-discovery protocols, and this includes SLP and UPnP, SSDP, and, and things, they conflate two steps, which I think are different. And what I'm talking about there is discovery as opposed to use. So in the discovery step, you say, and I'll use the boring old example of printers, in the discovery step, you say, I want to print, show me what my choices are. And here at, we have the terminal room printer, in other places you might have five. At the point of choosing which one to use, you don't need to know the IP addresses of all of them. You don't need to know other details about them. You just want to know enough for the human or the software to make a decision. So the discovery step is a lightweight operation that gets a, a brief summary of each service on the network. When you've picked one to use, that's the step when you need to know the, the contact information, the address and the port, and, and maybe other details about it. <clears throat> And in the example of printing... I don't believe that. Which part do you not believe? Uh, the part where you think that selection uh, can be done without knowing whether you support a common transport. <clears throat> that's, um, <clears throat> that's a philosophical debate, I think, about when you define a service as being this package of protocols, um, like how much is included in that bundle, I, I think is a, a question uh, of what so you I, 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 grant, I, I gather that you're arguing that uh, discovery can be done with blue, pick which blue one I'm going to use. And this is an example where all the blue ones are different, but pick a case from a resource directory, you have a bunch of blues on different servers or whatever. Right. Um, and so I'm gonna pick the blue one without having any of the red information. Okay. And even if there's ones that are mandatory to implement, that doesn't mean that it's actually in use by that particular server, right? So let's say one is v4 only as a server and one is v6 only as a server, right? And, uh, and if you're a v6 only node, you can't necessarily talk to the v4 only one, right? I'm just picking an example that many of you can relate to, even though it's not the one that would be the most, use, most uh, likely. Um, right, and I think maybe where we disagree is, is whether it's necessary for the discovery step to do this very precise filtering that you can't discover things that you won't subsequently be able to communicate with. Because if you follow that logic yeah, to its conclusion... Yeah, you can absolutely discover things. The question is, you are talking about selecting before doing the discovery of the actual transport information. And that's what I'm responding to. Right. And the reason I'm saying that is that the transport information may change from day to day. And I'll go back to this printer example. Um, uh, on, on, on a laptop, forget iPhones and iPads, but on a laptop, you typically go into system preferences, you click the plus button, you see a list of printers, you select one, you make a print queue for it. That is the selection phase. After that, for a typical user, they set up the printer once when they get it, and every day after that, they hit command P and print. They don't need to browse the network to find the list of printers. They know the name of the printer they want, and they say, how do I connect to it today? And its DHCP address may change from day to day. If it's using dynamic ports, the port may change. If it gets a firmware update, maybe yesterday it didn't have v6, and today it does. So the details of how you connect to it change over time. The selection, especially in the case of setting up a print queue, is sort of a once-in-a-lifetime thing. And to conflate the once-in-a-lifetime thing with the daily thing, I, I think, is, is missing some important distinction there, both in terms of efficiency and functionality. I'm trying to, I mean, we should let Kerry yeah. probably speak. I'm trying to up-level that to try to figure out what the point is for the core working group to consider as to what we should do. Right? So if, I don't know if, Kerry, you have a comment, but I know you've been waiting for a long time, so. Yeah. Maybe just one comment. Um, in this working group, we are kind of used to people coming in and uh, saying something based on experiences with processes that involve humans. And uh, in, in our case, often we don't have those humans. Uh, so it's sometimes hard to actually transport those experiences over to, to our work. Uh, Carsten, with respect, this is an argument I've heard a hundred times uh, in many different situations that, that the Anima working group gave me exactly the same story, which is we need a service discovery mechanism to discover things on the network. And we can't use Bonjour because that's only for humans. And that is complete nonsense. I don't know where this myth originated. I'll give you one example of something that is 
10 years old now, the, the Bonjour Sleep Proxy, which is what lets your iMac go to sleep and still be doing printer sharing and, and, and file sharing and screen sharing, even though it's gone to sleep to save power. When it goes to sleep, it looks on the network and says, I'm going to sleep. Is there a sleep proxy that can act on my behalf while I'm sleeping and wake me when I'm needed? It discovers that sleep proxy using Bonjour. The service type is sleep-proxy dot underscore UDP. It does a browse, typically white wireless base stations, Apple TVs, anything that's low power and always on is a good candidate for being a sleep proxy. So you may have four or five on your network. The iMac going to sleep will do a browse, find them, make a determination which one to use, connect to it, transfer its records, go to sleep. We've been doing machine to machine serve discovery for 10 years and I keep being told, bonjour, can't do machine to machine, it's only for humans. And I have no idea where this myth came from. Carrie Lynn, um, I think I had two comments when I came up, but now I've got four or five. Um, so first comment I want to make is that uh, I agree that not all resources are services, but certainly uh, something that looks like a RESTful API endpoint, you know, I think we, if we squint, we can probably see that there's some rough equivalence between that and what DNSSD has traditionally called a service. And later today in DNSSD, I'm giving a brief pre presentation on how to map between those two systems, between those two naming systems. Uh, number two, I just want to uh, uh, mention something historically, which was what th that, that Colin Jennings uh, proposed at one point, uh, a scheme called HTTP plus SRV. So I, I'm not sure you meant to say we can't represent service names in URIs. I, I didn't. There's plenty of places you can try to wedge it in there, and I talk about a couple of them in the draft. Okay, great. Right. For, for example, right, you can have, you know, underscore service name dot underscore TCP dot rest of the host name in the, in the host portion of something if the scheme defines it that way. Right? That, that's legal. You can't take an existing scheme and retrofit that, well, in any interoperable way anyway. Um, but it's absolutely possible, and that's in the draft. But, but that, that's an example which actually embeds um, the actual transport in there because the underscore TCP is in there in that example. Okay, the third thing is, uh, I think one thing that might have gotten lost in uh, a comment that Stuart made, which turned into the selection discussion, is that I think the dominant paradigm for discovery is that you know ahead of time what you're looking for, whereas uh, maybe in a very small percentage of cases, you would want to go to a device and say, okay, what can you do? Yeah. Uh, the, Both the, the, are use cases in core, absolutely. Yeah, but the latter, I think, is, is you know, really, you know, in the, in the minority. Uh, uh, it's a, a case for pretty much every device, but not every use case of that device. So, okay. for example, well, your security configuration tool for every device needs the ability to do that. That's about the one case where I can imagine, yeah. you know, that it's useful. Yeah. Uh, and the fourth point is that um, I think the response can potentially be driven by information that comes in in the request. So. Uh, there was uh, a draft that I was responsible for a long time ago called uh, XMDNS, uh, where we were looking at expanding it, you know, to to a larger scope, the larger multicast scope, and essentially we used the uh, the type of address in the source field to drive what came back. So if it's a global address uh, of the sender, then you respond with you, you don't include uh, the link local address, you know, in the response because you know, obviously they can't do anything with it if they're if they're off link, or you assume that they're off link, and so that information is not particularly useful in just waste bandwidth. So that could also help in the selection process. Uh, so Tim Carey, Nokia, just a, a quick comment on on Stuart stuff. Uh, I will say that for some other uh, SDOs that are doing IoT, they actually use DNSD for. Uh, for discovery, uh, we don't necessarily have the constrained pieces of it, but it's interesting to note that if you can put an MDNS in 900 bytes, you guys might want to consider it. Now, uh, as to this, um, my my question is, and I, you know, I understand the pressure that you're feeling, right? You know, because you're, we're trying to get this thing out, right? Uh, so my pragmatist and my business hat on, I, I'm like going, man, we got to get this thing going. Uh, the question I have is that it, it, outside of that, 
isn't the draft that we have for protocol negotiations solve this problem? Are, yeah, you, are you talking sure. about a co-app draft? Yes, yes. If you look at this one right here, okay, so if I take a different example than the one that's on the slide here, it's still an OCF example, okay, look at the second blue line where it says co-app S and co-app S plus oh, yeah. TCP, right? That one is, let's pretend that that one said and said co-app S and HTTP S. Okay, now tell me how your protocol negotiation one solves that. If the, the answer the is yes, it does, the, then the yeah. The protocol negotiation draft, as, yeah. as I understand the draft, and the, I guess we'll have a presentation on that soon, so someone probably might understand it better than I do, but it's supposed to be where the, the client and the server can negotiate the alternative transport sets. And so part of that is okay, the discovery yeah. component. Uh, and so I'm just, I, I, my curious is, as it right, says, I, think, I, think I understand this that this might be, this, and, and we have pressures, yeah. but does that solve this open issue that we've got ourselves in, in my, so my business side is like, hey man, let's go make some money, right? <laughs> My engineer so, side says, am I in a corner? <laughs> have I painted myself into a corner, right? So we, 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 we will have a couple of minutes to, to do that part of the uh, discussion. Right now, we are, we are still yeah. at, at yeah. this end. Well, so it comes so, back around so to say, are we making the wrong selection? Yeah. 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 I think I can answer your question if it's equivalent to like the mm. alt serve document that's in um, HTTP BIS, right? which is if you which, if I understand right, you open up a connection across one protocol, you ask it for its alternate transport, so now you get it. So there's a discovery step that says, I contact the machine and I ask it. Okay. And so, yes, that's solved at the disadvantage of being an extra uh, round trip that slows down latency and increases bandwidth. Compared to, let's say I got this from a directory, whether that directory is a resource directory or whether it's a DNS server or whatever else. Okay, If the stuff came back from the directory, using the term generically, right, then I wouldn't have to have as many round trips to do the negotiation. right? So does it solve it? Yes, but it's got some downsides. Um, okay. Uh, so, so the problem is, is that I can hard code everything, <laughs> if you will, right? Or I can Learn actually do, yeah, or, yeah. or or I can, yeah. and, and where does it sit between? So right, I, I'm right, unconvinced right. that um, I I'm unconvinced that 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 round trip isn't isn't necessary, right? Yeah. So we're what we've seen going back outside the scope of just core, right? Is that different SDOs and different applications have a variety of use cases. And it's very difficult to come up with a one, everybody should do it the same way. And so whatever way we agree on, there's probably going to be some SEO out there that's going to do it some other way anyway. And so the topic of this is to figure out what we do with the URI schemes, right? What the IETF will do with the URI schemes, right? We can't necessarily control what other SDOs or other proprietary implementations are going to do, but we can control what we're going to do in the IETF, okay? And so is the IETF going to have URI schemes? Is it going to have URI schemes that are sort of locator level? It's going to have URI schemes that are sort of ID level, or is it going to have URI schemes that are kind of both? Okay, we have, that's a decision we can make that can control our own destiny. We can't necessarily control what other people do. Right. So we, we have uh, used almost the entire uh, space uh, we have for the whole topic, and we are just in, in the first of three. First slide, yes. yes. <laughs> So, Stu, can you make a quick comment? I'll be really quick. I was just struck by some irony here. Looking at this slide, there's like maybe 25 lines, average 40 characters per line. There's about 1,000 bytes of text there. It's so because the, it doesn't appear this way on the wire. The text on the slide we're discussing is bigger than the implementation of multicast DNS service discovery that's in the site player Telnet. Right. Well, um, what's I, shown on the screen is JSON. What appears in the wire is Seaboard, for example. So, yeah, it's not representative of the number of bytes. But in terms of the number of bytes, it's a, it's a very verbose representation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe one clarification when you talk about those 900 bytes, that's an MDNS advertiser. It's not an MDS, MDNS implementation. Thank you. It doesn't browse for services. It only advertises for services. I don't think that's the main question that we're talking about. It's useful background information, but it's not yes. the main question. Right. OK, so I think we, we finished this segment. Yeah. Yep. And uh, now let, let's focus back on what this working group has to do. So you if, to if you want to sit down, that, if you want to sit you down, that, that's fine. That's fine, I think. Um, so just to remind people, the, the Dash 07 that we gave to, to ISG had uh, three um, URI schemes. I mean, one was defined in 7252 already for UDP, and it added the TCP and WebSocket version. I'm going to to not say all the same 
thing again happens for coil S every time. So always think th that we have another set uh, for coil S. Uh, so in total, O7 left us with six uh, UI schemes that can be used uh, to, to talk to a, a coil uh, server. Um, now, we, we talked about those ISG concerns and uh, what, what uh, the authors tried in Dash Online was uh, to uh, simply define one URI scheme that maps to all three uh, transports. And uh, I think uh, we have heard why that, that doesn't work so well. Um, so the compromise uh, that, that is now currently on the table is to revert to Dash 07 but also to add a fourth pair of uh, URI schemes that does have um, some, some form of transport discovery in it. Now, that, that's a wonderful way to, to solve the impasse, but it also leaves us with a little uh, job to do, <laughs> which is to define that uh, fourth uh, scheme. We have to define the rules for this thing, with, which I called Core plus AT after the suggestion of Bill uh, here. Um, so all transports. Um, so this would be um, a, a UI scheme that is equivalent, uh, a UI scheme, U UIs of which are equivalent to the Core App, Core plus TCP, and Core plus WS forms. Now, this is a little bit weird because we have an equivalence between the AT scheme and the transport specific schemes, but it's not quite clear that we can simply stipulate an equivalence between the transport specific schemes. Maybe we can do that, uh, but uh, I think a little bit more thinking is uh, needed here. So for instance, one thing is um, the curl protocol has uh, defaults uh, for the UI scheme. The UI scheme is actually uh, rarely transmitted uh, in Core App, and we have to make sure that the default uh, we take is actually the one that, that we should be uh, uh, taking. So th there is a little bit of work to do here. Barry. Hi, this is Barry Lieber. Is the intent that Coap plus AT would eventually become the scheme you used and you'd stop using Coap? Uh, Dave Taylor. My belief is that the intent would be um, to be the same as OCF's intent of the OCF code, which is a thing that applications should use. Unless you're some really low-level application or something like that, that most applications would use uh, COAP plus AT and be completely oblivious to which transport scheme it was or what other locators, what the port number, or what the IP address or whatever else. Yes. Yeah, so th th that's one way to view it. Another view is um, that the, the area where we need these additional transports actually is a niche within the current ecosystem. So we will still see a lot of use of the UDP-only uh, scheme because that, that's a very normal way for, for a very constrained uh, device to, to operate. Um, but um, the, the fun part is uh, we could define multiple of these encompassing uh, UI schemes. I mean, OCF already has one. Uh, so we, we, we're just adding one, and uh, then a third organization comes there and adds another one. Um, so uh, it's not necessarily the case that the Core Plus AT would be the one that is most widely used in the end. So, Dave Saylor. Um, the so I, nobody asked the question, so I was asking myself in my head it, if um, coat plus AT were defined, and let's pretend that it was even in draft 07, would OCF use it? And I suspect the answer is depends on how you define it, bordering on no, but not necessarily no. And the reason was because the OCF scheme has multiple transports right now, which include the various coat ones and the various HTTP ones. And so if you have a resource, it's the same RESTful resource, and it's available over, say, uh, uh, co-app with one or more transports and HTTP, 
then would you be able to use the COET plus AT scheme or not? That depends on how you define it. If the answer is yes, then in theory, it's, a, it's, it's similar to what OCF did, okay? At least subject to this, there's a different constraint as well that I won't go into right now unless you ask, which I'm happy to, uh, which has to do with the security stuff. And so we'll get to that in that probably in another might comment or two probably. So I may come back to talk about that. Um, but here, uh, the question is, is COEP plus IT, is it inherently COEP specific or is it not inherently COEP specific? And I'm thinking about the, the alt service discussion here that says, okay, can you do protocol negotiation and find out there's an alternate service over TC, over you know HTTP? And if so, then maybe you define this as not being COEP specific and then it would be more generally useful to other organizations. So just a thought. So the reason I said that Dave's answer previously was what I was hoping to hear was that I look at this as we painted ourselves into a corner that we didn't know we were in when we did co-op. We are now getting ourselves out of that corner with co-op plus AT and I would like to see us move toward that. And now Karsten said, oh, but if you know you don't need the new features, then you can still use the old one. I would really prefer to see us move rather than have both of them actively in use. Although the other side of it is you said often that the scheme is not even used because you know what you're doing and you, do, you, you don't actually pass the URIs around, which is different. But I think if we use the URIs and we do this strange mechanism, I'd rather see us move to it rather than leave the old one as recommended still. And obviously it's going to exist and people can use it, but I'd rather it not be the one that we recommend using. Um, so I'm going to try to jump ahead and give my current leaning as to where I think we should go. Um, my current belief is that it's going to take a while to do the details to be worked out. And that, so my proposal would be the details to be worked out being a separate draft than the current draft. And that it contained a sort of a forward reference to say, that, you know, uh, future, left for future work is the following requirement that needs to be done. Okay. And so the details of what COAP plus AT is, is in a different document such that you're defining the things that applications aren't supposed to use here, and then the things that people are supposed to be using in a different document. Um, and that's because things like uh, OCF and other organizations already have protocol implementations of the co-op plus TCP protocol. And if you are not using the URI scheme as your syntax for the locator, then you don't actually care about this discussion, right? And so you don't want to slow down the protocol stuff going to RFC for people that don't happen to be, that, you know, OCF is using URIs as the syntax, but other people don't have to, right? And so that's why I would propose that we could decouple and put into a different document um, and saying left for future work is, is, is great. So I kind of think that's where I'm going, which means that the details we worked out, there's not as much urgency for, and we can take our time and get it right, and we don't have to answer it, say, all in this meeting, okay? Yeah, and Barry is saying he would like it to be a document that updates this one. I don't have a preference either way on that one. I think it could be done either way, but if Barry's, I have no objection either way. Um, and so the types of things that are part of the details to be worked out, okay, I'm just going to say an enumeration of the sorts of details, right? I don't know if you have a slide on that, but the things that come to mind is you have to have a way of sort of discovering the relationship or learning the relationship between a particular co-op plus AT and a set of other transport locators, whether they're those URI schemes or some other format, right? You gotta have the discovery mechanism. Is, is it updates to the resource directory document? Is it updates to the link formats document? Is it how to use DNSSD? And so on. I think that's gonna be a, a bunch of discussions. How do I learn that? Second part has to do with security. This is the part that I said I'd come back to the mic about. Um, one of the things in the architecture, the WWW, that it actually encourages different URI schemes for is when you have different security semantics. And so if you have HTTP and HTTPS, right, you want those to be set. So it makes this argument that that's actually a good thing. And so I think there's also this question is, does it need to be co-app plus, co S plus AT and co-app plus AT or just one? Okay, That's another part of the detail to be worked out, right? And so I'm saying we don't have to answer all those right now if we agree that it is not a deadline in this meeting, right? But I'm saying it is not a short set of details. Yeah, as an area direct time, I think I'm, I'm okay with this being worked out in a separate document, as long as the working group is committed to actually doing work. So can, can we avoid that being a normative reference that causes the other document to be in the RFC editor queue for a year? 
Yes. Yeah, that, that, was, that was Dave's point with having a forward reference and my point with using updates to make that happen. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the other point is, is the irony of ISG started, can we have less URI schemes, please? And we ended up with more at the end. That's <laughs> Yeah, so um, I think that, that uh, I'm not going to try to summarize it, but I think we, we uh, have managed to find a reasonable uh, way. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, so, um, we unfortunately used the entire time we had in, in this slot. Um, so, um, I just want to uh, point out, uh, we have got work to do to, to make this new scheme, this, this discovery-based uh, scheme work. Uh, th there are two documents uh, that are out there uh, that, that probably would inform this discussion a lot. And one is the protocol negotiation document that, that was already mentioned, which uh, provides one way um, of uh, finding things, which is uh, uh, based on already being able to communicate using uh, one of the ways and then f finding uh, other ways. And um, I, I'm, I'm going to skip the real slides, Bill, I'm sorry. Um, and um, so th this is essentially an option that, that looks a lot, lot like the alternative service um, approach. And um, the other uh, point is, um, if we want to support this discovery, we have to provide the places in the discovery infrastructure that we are building to provide that information. Now, DNS already has service records, but if we are not using DNS, uh, then uh, we have to find a place to put that. Um, the, the link attributes, which are now called target attributes, of the link format of the resource directory provide us with one way. And we probably should look into um, the, the various um, discussion documents we have to find out uh, how we are going to use this. So again, look at the, the two drafts uh, from uh, Bill and go ahead. Hi, uh, this is Bill from TUT. Um, yeah. the. The nice thing about IETF is that usually uh, things proceed at a regular, reasonable pace, and um, then when it comes to the IETF meeting, suddenly everything happens. So these slides were prepared when, when um, we before we had the discussions with Karsten and, and, and a few others. So um, the the reason why there are two drafts instead of one is that um, while the um, alternative transports draft, which was um, commissioned or charted or um, requested for trying to identify uh, the transport uh, a co-op uh, resource can be exposed with, uh, can be done with a URI. Uh, we also noticed a similar problem about how to discover the multiple transport endpoints. And, and that's why there are two drafts. Um, and, and these two uh, drafts took a life of their own. But um, recent discussions for, for these uh, two features were very useful. For alternative transports, what I'd like to say is that um, the current draft analyzes why you cannot put the transport information anywhere else than the URI scheme. Um, it does not say why we need a URI. So that is uh, something the draft needs to do. And um, just before Karsten and I discussed about the uh, Coop AT, that was one of my compromises, that we can use Coop plus AT for uh, doing other things than um, the URI proliferation. And um, for protocol negotiation, um, for multiple transports, what I'd like to say is um, we're going to try to work on uh, ensuring that uh, we could use the document as a means to um, discover the uh, multiple transport endpoints uh, at the origin server with or without resource directory. Thanks. Thank you. OK, so we are about seven minutes um, over uh, schedule. Uh, Carlos, can you do, you do your slot really quickly? So we are now in the section of uh, uh, documents that are uh, close to getting Recon Blast call. So can you try to be done at 10.45?
Okay, so good morning, I'm Carlos Gomez, and I'm going to present the current status and the plan for the next update of the draft entitled Co-op Simple Congestion Control Advanced, also known as COCO. So uh, let's take a look at the status of the draft. So the last revision is still 01, which is the one that was presented in Chicago. And uh, after that, uh, Jaime sent a heads up on this document before the intended working group last call. The heads up was sent to the core and TCPM working groups and also to the ICC research group. So after that, we received two detailed reviews, one by Michael Scharf, another one by Ingemar Johansson. So thanks to both for the uh, very good and helpful reviews. And uh, then we plan to update the document, hopefully addressing the comments we received. That would be version 02, and uh, that version will be the one actually intended for working group last call. So uh, let's take a look at the feedback we received and which is our position on the comments received and our plans for the updates. So in COCO, uh, as you may recall, we are defining uh, an RTO estimator, which makes use of strong and weak RTTs. So the weak RTTs are those that uh, where the sender has run into retransmissions. So Michael had a comment that uh, we would be uh, possibly violating RF RFC 8085, which contains this statement that uh, latency samples must not be uh, derived from ambiguous transactions. However, what we are here is that we are not violating that statement because we don't use only weak RTTs. We have both strong RTTs and also weak RTTs. And possibly we maybe uh, might need to make it clear that weak RTTs are actually needed in order to allow updating the RTO estimate uh, in some specific conditions where otherwise it would be very difficult or even impossible. So some examples are uh, links where there is high bit error rate, uh, where maybe there can be intervals of very bad link quality uh, with lots of losses. Therefore, there would be a high amount of uh, weak RTTs there. Then another example is a network where congestion suddenly appears and then the RTT suddenly increases significantly. In that case, uh, there would be spurious timeouts so then the RTTs collected would be weak and without using the information from weak RTTs, it would not be possible to actually update uh, the RTO estimator to the new situation leading to a really bad performance. A possibly more extreme situation is that of a link or a path with a very large RTT, actually larger than the default initial RTO. And in that case, there would be always spurious timeouts, and without weak RTTs, it would not be possible to update the RTO uh, estimation. So, one thing we are considering is to make the impact of strong and weak uh, RTTs something tunable. So, currently what we have is that the contribution of the strong estimator and the weak estimator is the one that you can see uh, on the slide with a weight of 0 0.5 for the strong estimator, a weight of 0 0.25 for the weak estimator. However, we are considering to make this something tunable. For example, by using uh, parameters, configurable parameters like the ones shown in red on the slide. And we would use default as default values for these parameters, the ones we have been using so far, 0 0.25 and 0 0.5. So the idea here is to be able to tune COCO and to tune which is the impact of each one of these two estimators for the network where this is to be deployed. Then we received a number of editorial uh, suggestions. First of all, well, the first is in the abstract itself in order to make a bit clearer what we are doing in the document. Then. Uh, we must admit that section one is currently almost empty and we got a comment from both reviewers that there's content in section two that might be a good fit for section one. Then in section four, we have some text where we explain that 
uh, in Coab, there's application processing time that uh, is relevant here for RTO calculations, whereas uh, that would would not be relevant for TCP. However, Michael had a comment that uh, we might want to discuss the impact of TCP delayed acknowledgements. So we plan to incorporate this into the document and explain that TCP delayed acknowledgements may add uh, typically delays of 200 milliseconds, uh, even more in principle. And uh, on the other hand, in Coab, we have separate responses where uh, delays of up to one second might be incurred. Then in the specific part of subsection 4.2, uh, we have uh, received the request to better motivate which are the, the properties and the, the reasons for the weak estimator. So we plan to incorporate this as well. This is reasonable because actually this is, as far as I can tell, possibly the first time that something like this, this kind of weak estimator is being used in the ITF. And also we've been asked to add a few more examples and even pseudocode to uh, make it clear how the different steps of the algorithm need to be applied. Then uh, we may need to add a few references to RFC 7252, uh, mostly for uh, readers that might be not so familiar with Coab with the terminology and also with the details on its behavior. And then uh, Michael had uh, a comment about uh, something that could be useful for the security considerations that maybe an attacker might want to drop packets in order to increase the RTO and therefore degrade network performance. So this may be mitigated by uh, network access control. And if the attack is performed by means of radio jamming, then we are that the network may recover in a reasonable time if Cocoa is used, uh, actually in a smaller time than that with default co-op. And here again, the weak, the weak estimator would be really useful. So we plan to incorporate this uh, into the document. Finally, on the appendices of the document, the first one is Appendix A, which describes an algorithm for aggregate congestion control. So, uh, this is an algorithm that was not so well evaluated as the core of the document. Uh, so our intention was to actually remove this part from the draft and the feedback we received uh, actually confirms this. So unless there are objections, we will remove this in the next update. And uh, the other appendix is a summary of uh, results and pointers to detailed documents with detailed evaluations. and. The, the comments have been that this appears to be a, a useful appendix because it supports uh, the mechanisms that we are defining here. So uh, that's all actually. I don't know if there may be any comments or questions. Let's go to the next slot. Alex, Michelle. Which of these microphones actually works? Hello. Good morning. Uh, first slide. Okay, uh, I will start by a, a summary of where we had uh, for uh, about the Comai Com framework. Uh, we have four drafts. First one is the Yang to CBOR, so that's the mapping between the Yang data model and the CBOR encoding. That is stable for two IETF. We don't expect to do any more changes, so we be believe that it's uh, ready for working group last call. That's, some, that's the question that will be had by uh, Alexander 
later during the presentation. Uh, second draft is the, uh, it's about the identifier used by COMI, the SID. That, that draft described the registration process. So right now we're working to, to, to establish a website for registration. So during that, that work, we, we might need to adjust the draft. So that, that work uh, will be done between, uh, between this IETF and the next one. So that, that one is not ready, but we're working on it. Uh, next one, it's, about, it's the protocol itself, Komai. Uh, we did extensive work, so I will, ha I will uh, thank uh, Peter van der Stock for all the help he did uh, to bring that uh, draft to closer to completion. Um, uh, well, I will go to a uh, summary of all the changes we did. Uh, it's not ready for prime time, but I think all the technical content is in the draft. We, we just now uh, need more reviewer. Um, the last one, it's uh, a data model used for application discovery, the Yang library. Uh, in Chicago, there was discussion about, is it the right, uh, is it in scope for core, is it the right forum? So that's a question that will need to be answered. Uh, there's other data model in the queue, such as uh, even logger firmware upgrade. So that, that's, that's something we'll need to decide. I don't know if the chair has some opinion about what will be the right forum for those data model. Um, Seems to work. So um, basically, I think we we have tomorrow's meet meeting to uh, find out what a good division of work uh, would be here. So. Um, of course, we we would be the working group to do MIBs for co-op. So um, yes, fundamentally, it should be possible to do the kind of work here. But uh, maybe there is another group that has the, the better experts for this. So let's find out tomorrow. OK. Uh, I just want to note that uh, for the Yang library, it's a, it's a, it's a a, a reference in Komai for application that is a mandatory reference. So we'll need to resolve that. Yeah. Yeah, this is Hank Burkholz. Um, we are facing a similar decision problem. We wanted to start at a uh, uh, Komai Yang module for software inventory. And we're also considering, are we going to NetCon for, do we start this work here in core in the end? Because um, I think we're pretty sure that we know how to do the the, um, the concise representation stuff, and that's all done. And but we are not the netconf experts, so to speak. And so we are actually considering starting that work in the netconf group. And yeah, I think there should be some discussion on that. And I'm not sure if I see Mr. Misix at the table. I'm confused. <laughs> okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so the, the, the hard problem here is simply you need three groups of experts. You, you need people who know the, the Yang world, you need people who know the constraint world, and you need people for, for the specific subject matter like your software identification uh, and so on. Um, so that's always a little bit hard to, to put somewhere. We will put it somewhere and let's figure, out, uh, figure that out tomorrow. Okay, now I will go to uh, a summary of the changes done to the, the, the protocol document, Komai. Uh, first one is about the resource type. Uh, so we re rename some of them, so they are more obvious. So we have a resource type for the data store, for the data node, and the event stream. Uh, we also uh, did uh, some fix to the recommended path. So we don't have any more conflicts between data nodes. 
and even stream and URI. So before uh, the stream was one of the data node, which is two different resources. Um, Next slide. Yeah. Okay. And next one is the introduction of uh, content format. We have uh, defined uh, five content format. First one is to return values. Those values are the encoding is defined in the Yang to Seabor uh, draft. Uh, so. Uh, for each of them, we define the, the rule for delta encoding for, for compression. In that case, is the, the, the reference uh, SID is the parent, and for the root, is, it's in the URI. Uh, second content format is uh, an array of values that's returned by a fetch. Uh, again, the uh, delta encoding is the, the parent. Next one is for a data tree, so it's to return an entire uh, data store. Um, for that one, we had to introduce a new Seabor semantic. Uh, we call it right now uh, order map. It is based on an array. Um, Delta encoding is uh, based on the, the previous sibling. Um, next one is the selector used by the fetch. It's an array of identifier. Delta encoding is sibling. And the last one is used by the patch. So it's an order map of instance identifiers. So instance identifier is a Yang data type used to point on a specific instance. So we have those lists of instance and identifier and the new value. When the new value is a null, it means deletion. If the value is not present, it's inserted. If it's present, it's updated. So that's the, all the methods supported by COMI and the associated uh, content format. So for access to data node, we use values. Access to data store, we use trees. The fetch use the selector and values, and the patch use the patch. So that, that's a good summary of what COMI is. <laughs> so all all the different methods supported by Komai. Uh, the order map, uh, we have a, a formal description of that semantic. We have requested a, a, a tag for it, a, a Seaboard tag. We don't use it, but uh, it will be available for, for other application. Um, in our case, it's infer when we do uh, uh, the content format uh, define if it's used or not, so we don't have to spend by to to put the tag. Um, okay, uh, another area where we we work a lot is the uh, error handling. Uh, we clarified there's two types of error. We have the, the, the co-op error we know, we, we love or we hate, but <laughs> all the, those errors already defined in co-op. And we have error rela uh, related to, to Yang, defined in Yang. Uh, for the implementation of those errors, uh, we use RESCOM as a reference. So on the left side, we have the, the payload structure of RESCONF. On the right side is the proposed uh, payload for COMI. Uh, one modification we did is to 
remove the ability to return multiple error in RESTConf, you could have a list of error. So in Comai, we'll return just the first or more important error. Um, also, Re uh, RESTConf has this concept of error type. So it's really, it defines which layer of the protocol the, the error come from. In Comai, uh, it's obvious if it's a Comai error or uh, a Yang related error. So that field have been removed. Uh, the tag in RESTConf is implemented as string. We changed that to uh, identity reference identity ref, so it's implemented as integer, but any developer could add new new error uh, using identity, Yang identities. Um, we, we did a change in the name of error path. We don't use path in Comai, so new name is data node in error. Not sure is the right name, Everything start by error dash and not that one. So we might revisit that name. Um, and error info, it's, uh, it's an object associated to the error that uh, can be returned. Um, that, that have been removed. Uh, if people believe it's really needed, we could add support for it, but at this point, we don't see much, much more need for that. So, um, so that's all the changes. Uh, yeah, that name, not sure is right. Okay, that's the list of Yang error. Um, most of them are specifically are defined in Yang 1.1. Some of them are described in the text, but there's no tag defined. Uh, for uh, for example, not in range. In Yang, they say uh, invalid value is returned if the the range uh, doesn't fit, but don't define any application tag for that. So we just define those tag and since they're optional people could could uh, could use it or not use it they could just return invalid value or could return invalid value because of the range or because of the pattern uh, we went also through different rest comp implementation look at uh, uh, C code and and the two other have been added malform and duplicate keys. So that that's the current list we we propose. A developer could extend that list if people believe there's more need to be added. We were we just come and see us. Uh, so I'm done, uh, so Alexander will continue. Any Thank, thanks, Michelle, for, for this. So um, as you see, we've done a huge amount. Michelle has done a huge amount of editorial work, and Peter also helped uh, a lot on this. So all these things that you see here, we agreed upon on the past ITFs. So as you see, it is simple to say, OK, introduce one content format so that we can uh, introduce content formats so that we can distinguish between you know the different type of things that are happening. And then we actually get down to the dirty work doing we, we end up with all these uh, things but right now it's pretty clean uh, so uh, we have um, at least two, so at least we know that we have two independent implementations uh, as of today uh, because there were some uh, last minute work uh, they are slightly 
incompatible with each other. There are really small, very small differences. Uh, so we have one implementation in Go. We have another implementation in C. And while we were here, actually, we discussed with other people, and we, dis we discovered that there are at least two other implementations out there. Uh, so we will have like a week or two so that we can get uh, synchronized with the small details that were the small deltas that are out there uh, and we are going to make an interrupt over the the internet uh, during uh, in august so that we are clear out that you know uh, the things are, are working and uh, of course we are planning to uh, to have an open source implementation that will be there for the next itf uh, and the goal will be to have an interop in person uh, at, uh, in Singapore and uh, probably have a hackathon. So we're pretty, pretty uh, happy with the things, uh, the way things are working out. Uh, all difficult things are behind. We have few small details to figure out. And so uh, the things that we have is, so here I think that maybe I made a mistake and this is really yeah, Before we go, the, a quick question, uh, who here is uh, implementing uh, some or all of uh, this ecosystem? So I know Michelle is, Laura, okay, thank you. Yep. So that's uh, that's the that's the first point. So uh, as it is as it is of now, we would like to go over this interop in the in the following month, so that we are pretty we are clear that you know if there are any minor ambiguities in the text, uh, that they are clear uh, clear out, and uh, we can go into a working group a group last call for this. So here uh, I've, I've put uh, ITF ninety nine, but I think. It would be wiser to put it last call before the ITF uh, in in Singapore. Well, whatever it is, I mean, it's uh, five documents. So uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly uh, on the Kamai document. This is okay. exactly on the Kamai document. Yeah. yeah it, so it still needs some time. Yes. It still needs some time, and uh, I would like to get uh, uh, over this uh, interrupt uh, process. As, I, as you can see, there are a lot of things that are actually coming from the Yang part of the of the, of the things, you know, the, the error messages and, and and so forth. So this is why we're actually actually also going to be discussing a lot with with the guys over there at Netmod to to get input from them. So if there are no questions on this, uh, let's move to the shortest presentation. I hope I will be making today. So this is the Cbor encoding of data models with Yang which we consider very stable. There are no negative commands, no bugs, no nothing. So uh, we have two options. Either we do a working group last call now, or if you would rather, we can wait for the comma interrupt during the summer and uh, do the, the last call later the, for this one and the comma uh, together. But they are not, you know, they can be independent. So when is that interop going to be? So the, the the first one was going to happen in August. Yeah, that, that's a long month. Starts with the first and ends Let's with say the first. third week of August. Third week of August. Okay, that, that's about four weeks from now. So um, I think that sounds like a reasonable time to wait. But there is no other blocking on this document that I perceive. Um, so um, I think we, we could bring a last call it now, but that, that would be... I mean, without implementation feedback, that's not so bright. Um, so I think it, it's better to wait for that round of implementation feedback and then go for working with last call right there. Okay, sounds sounds pretty good to me. So we do the working with last call after the interrupt in August, yeah. right away. So as, assuming we, we don't have to do major surgery <laughs> on yeah. the document as a result of that feedback. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, we probably will find another T that needs to be uh, st uh, stroked and another I that needs to be dotted. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially, we are last calling the document we have. Mm -hmm. Why, with the Komai document, I would expect the interop actually to bring up a little bit more stuff. Mm -hmm. So we will respin this document and it will be a little bit later mm -hmm. uh, in the timeline. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that's my perception. I mean, it, please please tell me when, when I'm wrong. I, I, I completely agree with you. So that, that's, that sounds good. So that's the status of, uh, of this document. 
uh, and, and just to recap, like this gives you, okay, if you have a Yang model, how do you represent it in Cibor, right? There is a, the, the equivalent in JSON and, and XML, so nothing too fancy. Moving on to the Yang scheme Id uh, item identifier. So this is also a draft where a lot of the things that are out there are pretty clear. So from the last time, uh, we had four main topics to clear out the definition of a SIP. Uh, that it is a 64-bit identifier to clear out the uh, the SIT file format, uh, the SIT lifecycle, and the allocation policies. So uh, since the last time we've cleared out most of these uh, of, of these uh, points, uh, the only small question is actually, I mean, we we're pretty clear with everything the way it worked. Uh, we talked with our with Diana, and uh, everything seems pretty straightforward. Uh, but we really want to be to make sure that we're doing things the right way, and that there are no corner cases that we we haven't covered. So uh, I'm going to be talking about this uh, on the next slide, and uh, just to give you an update on the action points that we had since the last time. So things that we discussed in in the working group, and that we said, okay, we will do the changes to the to the document modify the, the draft to introduce mega ranges, uh, organize a, a meeting with NetMod in, uh, through the, and this ITF, and provide a Yang regist registration procedure. So the first two are done. Tomorrow we have a meeting, uh, it's a side meeting, uh, and there is so, uh, a non-working group mailing list, so please subscribe to it, the Yang of things. Uh, tomorrow uh, we are from 10 to, to 12. I'll be talking a little bit more about this uh, later, and I'll try to be really brief on this. And then, while we were discussing the Yang registration procedure, we actually uh, uh, wanted to, to discuss something, uh, something with you uh, on this. And this is, uh, we would really like to, to have this th thing done correctly. So the things today, that, that the way they are working today is, we have these two registries. The first one is the SID Mega Range Registry, that is handled and managed by Ayana, that allocates blocks of one million SIDs to uh, secondary registrars that we call the seat range registry. And then, of course, if we want to have the, the, the very, very good and very nice quality of introspection, it is good to have a Yang registry. So the seats are actually the where you allocate the numbers, and then you have uh, another registry that you keep the Yang files, so that whenever, whenever you have a number, you can actually find out well, what this number tells you, uh, what, what it does represent. And the, the way it works today, so the, the, the workflow is as an end user or developer or whatnot, a Yang model developer, what they will typically do is, well, they request a seed range, they get, they get allocated this seed range, and then they go on their daily lives in developing Yang modules and so forth within the seed range that was allocated. And so that's really cool and neat, but as it is of today, there is no really implicit um, a way of actually making people share the Yang files, right? Other than, okay, it, it's really good for the, for the community and for the society, well, it is up to their discretion to go there and publish the, 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 the Yang file that they, that they did. So that's, that's one thing, and we could keep it as, as it is. We would like, so that, it, and it's really good for private module registration, right? This is a must. This is a must because people, they would like to be able to register private Yang files for, you know, for, for their internal consumption. Now, the things that we would like to investigate without slowing down the document and, and would like to get into, in, into our thought is how can we incentivize public Yang module registration? Where well, we have this link where, you know, you, you, you develop your Yang module, and there is an experimental range, and then you basically push it to, the, to some public registry. It can be Yang catalog, it can be something else. And then you, know, you, you, you directly get the SID file with the allocated directly from there. And so then you know, the public can, you know, anyone can just go there and, and look up from the SID the Yang file and it will all work out uh, pretty well. So this is like a slightly open question. How do we, how do, we do it? And uh, of course, there are uh, you know, things to discuss. What we would like to do, and the way we are actually uh, addressing this, this question, is to say, well, today we have 
on implementation of this registry, of the Yang registry, we have a Git repository. And by the end of August, so this will be for the interop, we'll have a, a running seed registry that you can go and you can, you know, you can request your seeds and so we can, we are able to do this interop, interop meeting. And the proposed action is uh, uh, that we, we would like to encourage this one-step registration where we come with a Yang file to a public registry, you register it and then you get everything out there. And uh, probably also include some parts in the in the uh, in, in the seed file that as it is of today, so that we encourage this introspection way of working, like a new array pointing out to some permanent place where you can find actually the Yang file. Maybe add some hash that you make sure that this is the Yang file you're talking about. Um, so our proposed action plan of action is just slightly modify the SID document as it is of today so that we don't block one-step registration which could be added in a second document in the future in case there is a need to. Thanks a lot, Alex. This is Pascal Tuber from Cisco. Um, quick question about the, um, when, when you have an item which is defined multiple times in uh, Yang, like MAC address or whatever, uh, would you uh, recommend that there are as many SIDs or um, would there would be a way to or desire to have single SID for multiply defined objects? Oh, okay. So the, if I try to, to rephrase to see if I got your question, is if you have uh, uh, some given type of something, would would uh, would we encourage people to say, okay, don't reinvent every time the notion of MAC address. Try to go to the module that once defined it and then just inherit from it and, and reuse well, it all. This is already done. Yeah. So taking the fact that things are defined multi multiple times, mm -hmm. um, what is the optimal design? Like, since the SIDs are not really allocated there, you, you, have, you will have to define this policy. And if, if you really want to do flow two, uh, at some point there will be some magic which will, will go from the, the repository, the, 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 the young mm -hmm. catalog, and fetch SIDs. And, People will build some automaton for doing this, and I was just wondering if we just let them pick things serially, then then we'll get as many SIDs as we've got multiple references of the same type. Whereas, uh, would that be desirable? That that basically the SIDs can act as correlator of types which are identical actually, but multiply defined. Just okay. Okay. So I, I see what you what you're saying, and this is actually why I, I really wanted to have this discussion, and I, I love your comment, and I think that we should take it into account. So the question if I get it correctly, is, okay, you, here you have a developer that publishes a module, and this module is not something that is on its own. It inherits from other types that have already seeds that are allocated to their other things. So this young registry, instead of just going and fetching new, fresh seeds for things that are already have allocated seeds, so this thing could actually go to the seed registry, and the seed registry can do some introspection and can see, oh, okay, by the way, my address already has a seed that has been allocated. So um, I, I think that's an uh, that's an ex excellent question. We have lots of seeds, so that's not the problem. But the problem is that we make sure that we don't redefine, like we don't end up with multiple seeds for the same thing. I'm, I I think that it is possible to do this without actually uh, to, to do like a best practice for this. So in theory, it could be. Both could be done. I would be in much in favor of what you're saying that we make sure that it always the same seed is used. So if you're using a, a MAC address, it's always the same seed for this MAC address if it is the same module. But yeah, I, okay. Yeah, on my, I think we're on the main. So yeah. Juan Carlos Zuniga, Sigfox. Uh, I have a different question, but just to follow up on this, would that mean a human intervention or automatic? Uh, uh, discovery of what exists in in the world. Uh, Pascal, it's just that we had this very very cool place where nothing has been done yet to to do this this flow that you represent here. So I I would just suggest that instead of just doing it blindly, we 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 care about what kind of result we want to achieve, and it's it's already the case that MAC address is defined in tens of of models, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, depending on what the desired effect, we should define whether an SID or its 
hopefully your an SID points to multiple is one to one, because the use of SID later will really depend on that discussion. And what I expect, it's yes, it's going to be automated. There, there won't be a manual. The whole goal of this design, there won't be a manual intervention. Somebody will write something, and then it will run all night uh, through the catalogs and get a result. Mm -hmm. And we really, really care about what this automaton will be doing because all the use of SIDs in the future will depend what that automaton will have done that day because after that it's history. Mm -hmm. completely, completely. Uh, Michel Veillette, I'll try to answer that question. Um, SID are assigned to Phil. Uh, Phil in Yang is called data nodes, so uh, not to data type. So let's say you, you have a data type that define an IP address and use for setting your DNS or use in the interface. The SID is assigned to that usage. So the, the IP address of a, your DNS or your, your server, your interface. And the Yang define those data nodes and we just map SID to each of them. By if you have different Yang file that set up DNS differently, this will be a problem. But if everybody use the same data model, the same Yang file for setting their DNS, there's no issues. Um, yeah, I think we, we will have tomorrow to to get to questions uh, like this. Thank you. Carlos. Well. Carlson, you have a Just a uh, quick question. Uh, coming back a little bit on your on your uh, slide, I think you you answered it. Uh, just want to make sure that it's clear. So you are not saying uh, public versus uh, private. You are saying let's start with public and then uh, we go for the private. This is like a two-step approach, not not like one or the other. Yeah, it's so it, it is a two-step approach. Let's start with this one because we it is already there and we know that it is not blocking mm -hmm. because pe industry so we got input from industry and, and, and people want to be able to register private modules okay. and uh, it gives you the option to actually go to the public one and the idea is let's m maybe add a minor thing that allows introspection so whenever we want to, to go to a public one then we we are not blocked with it okay so, thanks and move on because we are ready now to do the implementation of this and we have something that we did it manually for the moment so we now we want to to build the actually the software that allows you to automatically do the registration so let's move with this one and uh, you know at some point we we decide okay do we uh, you know we, we close this document and uh, maybe say okay set public registration BCP or something but that 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 should I think it we can split the two the two process right so I think that that's as far as we will get today uh, again we, we have tomorrow to go into uh, more detail so I, I would actually cut, like to cut short the the agenda item right here okay. so we just go to the next one um, I think on Friday we will get a quick report what happened uh, tomorrow so we can react to that here okay okay do I say a word about the Yang of Things or? Well, uh, th that's the the ad that that we already had. So there will be a Yang of Things meeting, mm -hmm. and uh, those people who are interested in in uh, managing uh, constrained nodes uh, may want to go there. And the room is way too small, so uh, come early. Okay. So we, we have uh, three more items uh, on the agenda, uh, with, which are hopefully quick items, but... Hi, hi, just a short intermediate comment for Yacht. Yacht conflicts with FUD. Yes. This is most FUD people want Yacht. And this yes, is so bad. just go, don't go to the FUD meeting, go to the Yacht meeting. That's no, we'll easy. go to second, but, but that's another <laughs> thing. So. Sorry about that. Yeah, conflicts in an IETF are brutal. Uh, Oh, you just have one slide, so we don't need a controller. So my name is Yariako. I'm here to talk about uh, device URNs. Um, this is a draft that has been uh, sort of uh, recovered or, or uh, reissued after years of uh, uh, sort of being uh, not being updated or discussed. Um, and the, the reason for the <coughs> update, uh, first of all, I, I was busy doing some other things. 
but now I'm back in technical work, so so that that's one reason. Uh, the other reason is that there was actually um, people who uh, were were saying that they are using these things um, in production systems uh, in in large um, scale uh, uh, systems, and and that uh, that might be a reason for for us to actually uh, com complete this process. There's also a reference from um, the CNML document to this this document, and, and some examples, which of course could be ex uh, uh, changed or or replaced with something else, but uh, that's another sort of a uh, editorial reason, perhaps, to do something. So, so these are essentially uh, identifiers, or, or uh, it's, a, it's a namespace for uh, pointing to hardware device identifiers, and uh, it's uh, complementary to to what we have in some other URN types, uh, either uh, with uh, ha other hardware identifiers like I I IMEIs or or um, or then uh, other types of identifiers like NIs and, and UUIDs. And what we do here is essentially define uh, a way to refer to uh, currently Mac and one-wire identifiers, but it could also be extended to do some other things. Um, and it's, it's mainly targeted for things like uh, um, you know, hardware registries or, or uh, equipment inventories and but also um, sensor data streams that this this reading came from that sensor, that, that sort of thing. Uh, there's um, there's an update of the draft uh, as I submitted it. Uh, there's another update queued up, uh, not completely done yet. Um, that would have to deal with uh, the new templates for uh, URN registrations, among other things. I also want to update the security considerations section, so it's it's fine to put things. Um, like uh, hardware identifiers in your your own database or equipment inventory and such, I used probably not spread them all around the internet, um, you know, without thinking about that. So that's that's a consideration to be added. Um, and I guess the main question is, uh, is there interest for this? Could we make this an RFC <laughs> finally? Um, interest from the working group or interest from the IETF in general? And uh, and also soliciting comments either now or later on on, on the actual contents. So that's it. So Tim Kirinoki, I will say that um, you know I, we actually use this in three different SDO bodies uh, for for pointing to device identifiers. So if there's a mechanism to make this an RFC, I think we, we would fully support that because we use them. Uh, is the intention to expand it to to additional um, identifiers? It has the capability to be extended, um, and the syntax is kind of obvious in that sense. Um, but it's it's up to uh, you know wh no, whatever I people mean, want. The, what in the new if, drafts if, that you're dealing with, I'm sorry. Is there opportunities to bring in new new identifiers in the drafts that it, you're referring it, to? It I mean, this would be an opportunity if you have some specific ones. We could add things now, or we could add things later. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, this is Henk again, and this is now my uh, Trusted Computing Group head on. Uh, the Trusted Computing Group is watching this stuff carefully. <laughs> so in, in a positive or negative way? In a positive way, because they have a lot of identifiers. Uh, most of certainly the attestation identification key. And so, um, yeah, we would like to see a specific uh, yeah, uh, integration of that. It would be the TCG, basically. Because uh, maybe we should talk some more about this, but uh, if, if we're going, because yeah, finding identifiers or identities um, are slightly different now. It's kind of hard, and they have a, a complete semantic um, OID subset. It's not registered yet for partial uh, identifying attributes and such. Maybe we could talk about this a little bit. And off, off yeah, it, it sounds like a topic that needs uh, yeah. sort of f further elaboration. Yeah. I mean, this is not the only possible way of doing identifiers, obviously. So we I know, look, I know, but, but this is one and, thing that yeah. is interesting. And also, I think that TE, but I don't know if Hannes, any T guys here, they're also very interested in talking to the right TE and identifying those. Right. So. Okay. Can, if you if you can post something on the list, then we could discuss. Uh, Dave Faber. Um, so I think this is a good idea, but I think that the first sentence there, a uniform resource name namespace for hardware device identifiers, I don't think that's what you're doing. I think what you're actually doing is hardware device locators, not identifiers. Mm. Okay. 
So because if you know, hard, some hardware devices have more than one MAC address. Okay, and so we had the discussion before about URI aliasing, and so these are locators, not identifiers. And so I still think this is a good idea, but I think if you actually want to use an identifier for a device, then you might be using something like the hash of your private key or public key that was generated by your TEE, for example. And if you've only got one of those, even if you have multiple MAC addresses, so this is useful for uh, device identify. Sorry, device locators. Yes. I don't know if it's useful for device identifiers. And if you're using it for locators, then that goes back to the question we had before is, why are you using URIs as the syntax for locators? Yeah, so um, I, I guess um, the, the use cases that I, I, I've seen for this involve um, not, not necessarily identifying exactly where you are in terms of, of the network, but rather just registering a particular uh, Pointer um, that that in indicates that this is it, it's this entity. We have other URN types for hash or public key based um, identification, which can be used. Or and we have UUIDs. The, these are a little bit more straightforward um, identifiers of hardware um, identities, which I think is uh, useful uh, e even if if you have those other. Um, Capabilities. We could talk about the exact way that we describe this. That that that's your comment, Dave. But um, anyway, yeah, may, maybe need more discussion. Hi, this is Hank again. I'm just quoting RFC 4949, and an identifier as a data object that definitely represents a specific identity of a system entity and distinguishing that entity identity, sorry, from all others. So, what? <laughs> ID and locator is a set of terms that many people in the IETF use for things that are sort of unique and stable, whereas locators are things that uh, may change or that you may have multiple of them or both of the previous two conditions, right? So if you have multiple MAC addresses, it's a locator in that sense. Uh, if you have multiple identifiers, okay, like multiple MAC addresses, then you have multiple URNs and it's the URI aliasing problem that we talked about before. Okay, which is you have two sets of, for example, sensor readings because they came from two different MAC addresses or because you switched the MAC uh, card on the machine that it's coming from. And I'm talking, I'm using that as an example, using terminology from a much bigger class machine than a, than a sensor, right? Um, and so I trying to correlate that is the problem. great discussion to be continued on the mailing list. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, we, we are really at the end of uh, th this uh, segment. This is very Lee, but we just quickly on that, we have many situations where things have multiple names, and I don't think that means that the names are locators necessarily. My question, Yari, I'm sorry, I have not read the draft, so you can answer this relative to the draft, is the third thing there, which in your examples is Mac and OW, intended possibly to be delegated to some other organization to allocate below? So for, for Mac, you, your, your, thing, your thing has a MAC address, and you, you can construct the URN, and you know what it is. But perhaps in other cases, you would need to go to another authority to have them allocate a URN for you or something. Is that intended to be a possibility? Well, well it's, a, it's a syntactical thing. We could have defined uh, a MAC uh, URNs, but we wanted to do device URNs, and then under that have another layer where we can sort of select and then we can perhaps later extend in various ways. Um, but there's another question of like who's responsible for the actual um, identifier space. And, and in this document, at, at least for the two cases that we have here, we'd be very clear that we are not responsible for that. It's those other guys over at IEEE, for instance, and, and so forth. So we are only sort of referencing the, that, that space, not, not claiming that this document or IETF or any, you know, any, anyone because of this has jurisdiction over those numbers we're just referring to right what, what I'm getting at is so now today someone can come and say I assign bleaks so I want URN colon bleak and I will assign them could someone come here and say bleaks are device identifiers and I assign them could I get URN dev bleak and I assign below that and, and do you envision that th that's a good question I think we should allow that but the draft currently doesn't have text that would talk about when that's okay because probably there are cases when that's okay and when it's not okay right so so we should develop that okay thanks
um, Alexey Melnikov, subject to more confirmation than there is interest in this, and I think they seem to be, but I just want to have a bit more confirmation. Uh, I would be happy with either working group document or a sponsored by me, so. Thank you. But it seems to have a little bit of work needed. Some discussion is, is indeed needed. Okay, so, so given that, I'm, I'm not going to, to ask the question whether the working group is ready to adopt that right now. Um, but uh, I sense uh, th there is interest uh, in the room. And I sense it meshes uh, very well with, with the other things that, that we are doing, in particular Cinema. Um So I would expect us to pick that up and not, not push it away to, to somewhere else. Thank you. Kessia? Hello, my name is Christian Amsus, and I'd like to present a document which deals with some open security problems that occur both in OSCOOP and with DTLS. Uh, next slide, please. You are in control. Oh. Ah. Yeah. Um, this document has a history of being published as separate documents. Um, there has been uh, John and Göran's um, Co-op Actuators document that describes some attacks um, and an option that mitigates them. Um, I've submitted a core request tag with, um, which describes another set of attacks and a solution to them. And what we've been doing in the last editing stage of this is pivoting this um, to have a problem statements document, which is not updated yet, and a joint um, utility options document that will help mitigate uh, those attacks. Uh, the first issue is freshness. Uh, both DTLS and OSCOAP um, provide only relative freshness in the sense that um, you know that a request is earlier or later, but you don't know that this is still current. Um, the kind of typical example is um, unlocking um, some kind of lock. The attacker swallows that package um, re and retransmissions. The uh, user goes away and the attacker later replaces that package which hasn't been seen by the server, so it's kind of fresh. Uh, the proposed solution is to have an option, however we will call it, right now it's called repeat, um, but we are open for suggestions, that says, um, client, um, your request was noted, but I won't act on it unless you say, um, I am the client and I am now ready to, I'm still ready to do this, which is expressed in a, in a short nonce that the server generates at random. And when the client can repeat that, the server will know that the client has, between the first and the second um, submission, at some point in time, been interested in changing this. Um, the, um, the solution also has applications in OSCOOP where we can use it to, to synchronize state, which we'd otherwise need to, to carefully keep track of. But unless there are questions about that, I won't go into much details on the other applications. The other issue is the correlation of the various parts of a blockwise transfer. Uh, to shortly recapitulate, um, recapitulate repeat, um, the, um, the various parts of a blockwise transfer are not strongly linked together, which is a good thing because this allows us to do kind of random access on, on co-op resources so you can fetch a particular block and just get that back. But in the context of um, having, a pay having a body that is sent with a request, this means that the server can never be sure whether those blocks are actually linked together. And I'll, in the next slide, um, explain a slightly convoluted but, um, example of, of how this can be used in an attack. This is a situation that usually won't occur naturally, so it only comes up in, in the security context. The solution we're proposing is to have a tag in, in, the, in the shape similar to the e-tag that is generated by the client that can be reduced under some conditions that are defined in the document. So the overhead can be kept low because the um, tags don't have to become large. They can actually stay absent. And if that option is applied correctly, the client, the server can be sure that the, the complete um, body it has assembled from several block requests 
is actually a, a, a body that the client intends the server to process. And again, this has um, different uses as well. Uh, in, when it is implemented in proxies, they can um, pr process different clients' requests to the same resource more easily without having to complete one before finishing the other. Um, I've presented, the, or actually Jörn has presented the, the attack um, this, that, that outlines the situation before. Um, if you have, an, a firm, say, a firmware update consisting of only two payload blocks, and the first, um, and the first upload is taken by an uh, stored by an attacker and suppressed, a later update could have that block injected, and then the, the server will receive a request body that has all its parts correctly signed by the, or correctly um, mapped by the client, but still would assemble something that will fail to perform, will corrupt the device whatsoever. And the request tag option um, is a way of dealing with that. Um, so there are um, two, uh, two questions I would like to ask, and um, two more that are the classical questions. One is, um, this describes how the server reassemble um, how the server reassembles the packages or the the um, the request blocks, and it may be a good idea to have this update the blockwise document so that all servers um, need to process that. Otherwise, the client will just see that the server has a um, an option it can't process and will be unable to do um, that secure operation. The other question is, are there any even more lightweight alternatives we, we did miss? One option would be to have to integrate with sequence numbers more, um, more deeply. The tricky part about that is to be sure that random access to resources still works when the server supports it. Um, yeah, and the remaining questions are, who has read the document, who has feedback for us on this, and how can we proceed with that? Yeah, so who has read the document? The authors have read the document, that's good. <laughs> and if you want. Okay, if you want, actually. Um, we have discussed this, uh, this set of uh, uh, problems a few times here. So ju just to verify, of the people in this room who think they understand the, the two problem statements, uh, th that underlie uh, these two mechanisms. Show of hands, please. Okay, so that, that's more like 20. Um, so we, we, we do understand the problem statement, and um, who has at least read a version of this document to, to have a rough idea that this is going in the right direction, solving it? Okay, that's the same people again. Alex suddenly hasn't read it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this this is a little weak, but we will confirm it on the willingness anyway. So uh, I, I ask it uh, anyway. So uh, the, the, of the people who who uh, know something about this document, uh, uh, who thinks uh, this is the solution? Uh, excuse me. This is the basis for the solution that the working group should uh, work on to solve these problems. Skip the question, should we solve these problems? Okay, that's about the same set of hands. So I think we, we do have in-room consensus. It's not very strong because it's a small group of people, but we will confirm it on, on the mailing list and, and uh, uh, send the confirmation call. Oh, thank you. And please fix the name. <laughs> Hello everyone, Marco Tiloka from Fly6. Uh, I'll give you some quick update about how to use OSCOA for securing co-op group communication. This is the overall set of related works to this draft over different working groups, and this specific draft takes place over there. 
Uh, just to give some quick background, but we went through that any other times, of, of course. Uh, OSCOP is used at the application level to provide end-to-end -end security between a COP client uh, and server, referring to security context, uh, some of it common, uh, the other part is sender and recipient split. Uh, this bind between uh, request and response and selective protections of parts of the COP messages. So this draft is about adapting OSCOOP to be used in, in a group communication context when you have a number of nodes acting as multicasters, so sending a via multicast IP uh, requests to the listener in the groups that can in turn reply back uh, with unicast responses. Uh, there's again binding between uh, requests and responses, same security assurances, including source authentication mandated in the draft body and forced through uh, asymmetric uh, signature. And as you can see in this example, at least, uh, a node has in general uh, a common context or sender context to uh, protect outgoing messages, doesn't matter if they are requests or responses, and then a recipient context per endpoint from which uh, a message is received. And recipient contexts are derived uh, runtime when it's needed. So the first time a message is received from that uh, endpoint. And this is version 02 right now. Uh, main features very quickly, uh, same uh, security requirements of OSCOR, full field, uh, as I say, especially source authentication through uh, asymmetric signatures, and we go for source, uh, for counter signatures embedded in the COSI object in the counter sign field. And this is all based on a, an entity named group manager responsible uh, for the group, especially for the sake of uh, the actual join process of new members uh, of the group and for handling, revoking, renewing the key material uh, in the group. And it's up to the group manager also to assure uh, uniqueness of endpoint IDs uh, within the same group that it manages. Uh, the updates from the previous version are quite many, based on many reviews we got, actually. Thanks all the reviewers for that. Uh, this is aligned with the latest version of also, of course, uh, we have introduced the new concept of pure listener. Thanks, Jim, shout about that, by the way. Uh, so it's a special listener you know, that doesn't uh, reply back to a group request, but simply receives them, verifies them, and takes some action uh, if asked for. Uh, such you node know, is especially, of course, easier to initialize and manage in case. So, of course, we, we revised the security requirements and the security context, especially uh, in the presence of this new uh, kind of node. Uh, some additional considerations, quite detailed, I would say, on the contest ID, and we indicated as mandatory to implement ED25519 as the signature alg algorithm to consider. Uh, also, we described a line again with OSCOAP how to uh, represent the compressed COSI object. And in doing that, we are now using also the countersign field that is not used in OSCOAP. And we have introduced a new uh, group ID field to indicate the context ID to be considered. Uh, we also extended quite a lot of the security considerations, especially for the sake of synchronization with sequence numbers in the group, and that applies for nodes that have just joined the group or for nodes that for any other reason can lose, lose synchronization with sequence numbers, for instance, in case of reboot or any other reason. Uh, we also revised a bit the uh, mechanism for public key provisioning uh, to nodes that uh, join the group. For the synchronization issue, by the way, we are referring, of course, to the graph just presented before. As preferable approach. Also, we added uh, two brand new appendices, uh, suggested uh, alternative modes that are not part of the main specification body, but, but still uh, someone should interest in, in having them. Uh, the first one, Appendix C, is about how to shift this approach to purely symmetric solutions, so without uh, uh, asymmetric signatures, and that can be the case for some use cases with particular requirement like uh, low message latency. Uh, in Appendix D, instead, uh, I, I guess that, that is also after uh, Jim's comment, we describe how you can preserve source authentication through uh, digital signatures, but uh, instead messages are not encrypted any longer. So that allows proxies for uh, something more. So they, they can still inspect and process messages and aggregate them without really uh, changing them. And uh, we decided it's better to discuss that in, in this very draft, even as an appendix, because it's this draft that introduces the use of uh, countersign field of the COSI object. 
we have also finally a first proof of concept implementation up and running in Contiki, tested in two platforms, Wismod and Smart RF. Uh, it's available on GitHub, and as related next steps, we want to keep this especially harmonized in details with less, uh, latest on scope, especially as to the com uh, compressed cosy object. Uh, check alternative ways to compute digital signatures in hardware, at least on the smart RF platform that allows that as an alternative to uh, software computing of digital signatures and start to produce some uh, preliminary numbers out of experimental evaluation. Uh, we have also related activity to this draft that we have recently submitted to ACE. Uh, uh, the problem is covered in Appendix A of this draft following a discussion started at IETF 97, and it's about the specific problem of joining the group, essentially interacting in a secure way with the group manager. So it's briefly discussed in Appendix here, but we have a proper draft in ACE describing how the group can be joined, interacting through the group manager, uh, having in a nutshell the joining node acting as uh, the ACE client and the group manager. Uh, as the resource server. And uh, the, detail, uh, the details, especially as to the secure communication with the group manager, are actually up to a specific ACE profile you decide to use for that. So to wrap up, again, this is the result version two already of many comments we, we got and integrated from many reviewers, especially Jim Shad and Klaus Hartke, uh, among others. Uh, that's, again, again, a summary of uh, updates I gave you in the previous slides. Uh, we have a first proof of concept implementation up and running that we intend to refine and use for first benchmarks. And we believe the document is quite in a good shape to be considered possibly for working group adoption. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Dave Taylor, this looks like really good work. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Just have uh, one follow up question. You, you talked about the addition of the pure listener. Um, so in the uh, 7390 or whatever it is, that's the group communication for co-op, that one only uses the ASM model. Now that you have the concept of pure listener, I wonder if this is also now potentially applicable even to the SSM model, where you have everybody as a pure listener except for one node. So my question is, is it actually potentially applicable, more generally applicable even than 7390? I think so. In the case, for instance, you have one multicaster that Mm, well, if it's the only one really that there's no need to have any other multicaster and then, yeah, the pure listener simply receive, never apply. Yeah, because certainly there are use cases in IoT for things that you have one privileged, you know, beamer of information and a bunch of subscribers that are, are, are unprivileged or whatever. That's an interesting IoT use case for, you know, advertise, you know, supermarket end caps or whatever it is, right? And so, if so, you know, even better, yeah, so. Thank you. So who has read a version of this document? Pieces? So I'm, I'm seeing about 10, 10 hands. Um, of those people who think this would be a good basis for doing work on this? That's fewer hands. <laughs> Am I really seeing fewer hands there? So who, who does not think it would be a good basis for doing work on this? Okay, maybe I'm just not, not having a good vantage point here. Um, and uh, who thinks this is a problem that we should be working on? Oh, a lot of people think that. Okay, so again, as um, I, I believe this is uh, uh, very clearly within our, our charter. I'm, I'm ready to be corrected. <laughs> Yeah, don't ask this question yet. yet. <laughs> right, so um, we have in-room consensus that, that this should be adopted, and we will confirm that on the mailing list. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, and we are at the end of the meeting, 1.5 minutes early. Thank you. See you on Friday. Yes. Where does the security respond? Absolutely. So, don't take anything that starts the latest in the working group, no matter whether you think it's a good idea or not. Until this is resolved, please.
Yeah, we can, we can, we can. There is no point because, you know, if it's already a train wreck, it might just become worse. So, and this is purely political thing? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, the latter one. Yeah, exactly.